Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another Bible study in Philippians. Today we're going to be talking about joy in adversity. Joy in adversity. Glad you could join for another Bible study today. Pray that uh, God will bless the study to your heart. Again, I'm pre-recording this earlier in the week, and so uh, if if you, uh, I, I always look for your interactions there in the chat. Do encourage you to uh, interact there and leave some comments in the chat so we can go back later and uh, share your insights uh, and share the joy of the Bible study together. So before we really get into it this morning, we're going to be in Philippians 1. If you want to open your Bible or if you're using an electronic Bible, go ahead and scroll on over to Philippians. Let's talk a little bit about Paul's persecutions. This is an important background uh, to get in order to, to better understand the focal package passage for today. Paul's persecution. First of all, we know that Paul was a persecutor of the early church. He was what he uh, what he referred to himself as a Pharisee of Pharisees in some of his writings. <coughs> Bear with me, not a, a very good couple of lung days here lately, so... We'll get through it together. But he did refer to himself as a Pharisee of Pharisees. In other words, Paul always strived to be a an ideal Pharisee. Before he came became known to Christ uh, and uh, became an apostle, commissioned by Christ, he was vehement in his persecution of the church. He may have been even like the Pharisees that Jesus described who traveled over land and sea to make one convert. Matthew 23, 15, Jesus referred to that. Paul also mentioned one of his key mentors, Gamaliel, in Acts 5, 34-39. He was recognized as one of the most famous Pharisees. Uh, in all of Judaism. And so Paul was not only a Pharisee of Pharisees, but he was set to be one of the top most influential Pharisees in his career. He persecuted the believers. He was present at the stone at the stoning of Stephen, gave his agreement to that uh, as those who did the stoning laid their cloaks at his feet. He was instrumental in ravaging the church. Acts 8, 1 through 4 talks about this. He was known to take believers as prisoner. Acts 9, 1 through 2 talked about that. Acts 26, 9 through 11 also states that he pursued and punished Christians. And then Galatians 1, 13 even describes him as intensely persecuting the church. He was devoted to to purging Judaism from this way that so threatened it. But Saul had a turning point. That turning point occurred around AD 35 while he was on his way to Damascus to arrest and imprison believers there. That was his purpose in going to Damascus. <coughs> on the road there he encountered the resurrected and glorified Christ who appeared to him in a blinding radiance and from that point on, after giving his heart and life over to Jesus Christ, being commissioned as an apostle, then he went about and all over the world, as far as he could go, anywhere that God would lead him, he went spreading the gospel, planting churches, writing letters that are now part of our New Testament Bible. While he was doing those things, he went from persecutor of church of the church to being persecuted because of it. Acts 9 tells us that he was threatened. Acts 13 says that he was expelled. Acts 14 says he was mistreated and stoned. Acts 16 says he was stripped, beaten with rods, flogged, and jailed in stocks. Acts 17 says he was mobbed. Acts 17:18 also tells us he was mocked. Acts 18 verse 12 says that he was attacked. 
Acts 20 verse 3 tells us that he was plotted against. Acts 21 says he was seized, that he was dragged out, he was almost murdered, he was bound and even mobbed. Acts 23 said he was sent before the Sanhedrin. And Acts 27 and 28 describes that he was imprisoned and accused. So Paul was persecuted. He went from Saul, the persecutor of the church, to Paul the Apostle and persecuted because of Jesus Christ and because of the church. The Bible tells us in 2 Timothy 3.17 that all who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. According to church tradition, Paul was arrested and subjected to a harsher imprisonment than he was as Acts 27 and 28 describes. He was condemned by the Emperor Nero and beheaded with the sword at the third milestone on the Ostian Way at a place called Aquae Salviae. He is buried on the site covered by the Basilica of St. Paul outside the walls. Paul's execution probably occurred in AD 67. 1 Peter 4.16 tells us if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in having that name. Paul was accustomed to and very familiar with persecution. Christians in some areas of our world today face constant pressure, intimidation, beatings, and even government censure are just a few of the difficulties they face. We see this even in more detail in recent events, in the recent persecution of Christians as reports continue to emerge from Afghanistan. These difficulties seem to not only dis seem to, to should discourage believers, that's what we would think, that when believers in these areas are suffering these kinds of persecutions that they would be discouraged, but instead it seems like the gospel spreads even more. That the more that the church is, dis is persecuted and discouraged, that the more the Holy Spirit encourages them and spreads the gospel. These believers seem to have a greater focus, just like the focus of an athlete who's struggling to train for and to prepare for a certain sport. But unlike many believers, these, these believers, these find joy and peace in the midst of challenges that they face. Why is it that Christians in America today, for the most part, I'm making a sweeping generalization here, seem to be more discouraged about the persecution of the church? or discouraged about their own adversity and seem to just give up instead of pressing on ahead and having joy in adversity. We'll see here in our study today that Paul, even though he was in prison, he had joy in his adversity. Well, let's look at the context. The context today of our focal passage, which is Philippians 1, 12-26. Having greeted his Philippian friends and expressed gratitude and prayerful intercession for them, Paul updates them about his own circumstances. He not only details his circumstances, but more importantly, he reveals his attitude toward what was happening to him. The personal testimony that Paul gives in these verses brings out in, in great contrast and in great boldness that he is relieved when he thinks about his Philippian brothers and sisters. In more than two dozen times, Paul uses the pronouns I, me, and my. He begins with a summary reference to the past of speaking by what had happened to him. Then he moves quickly to update the Philippian church on what was going on concerning the spread of the gospel as a result of what had happened. But the focus was not on his personal situation as much as it was on the progress of the gospel witness because of what was happening to him there in Rome. 
In particular, Paul focuses on the facts that Roman guards were responding to the gospel. That was the first thing. And also that the believers in Rome were gaining courage to share the gospel without fear. He talks about that in, in verses 12 through 14 here in chapter 1. Motivations for sharing the gospel, however, were not pure in every case. Paul had become aware that some were presenting the gospel in hopes of doing him even more harm as others were witnessing out of impure motives. Paul's heart for the gospel was evident in that he was at peace regardless of the mixed motives of others. Knowing that in every case, the good news was being spread in Rome. He talks about that in verses 15 through 18. Then returning to the reality of his own imprisonment, Paul expresses confidence that the prayers of the Philippians and the influence of the Holy Spirit would enable him to be delivered from any shame over the gospel message if not also would enable his deliverance from prison. His hope in any case was that Christ would be honored, whether by death or by his continued ministry. But his situation did enable Paul to reflect on either outcome of his day in court, whether released to continue living or preaching to face a martyr's death. He shared his confidence of being freed from prison, remaining alive for the benefit of the Philippian believers. This resulted in joy and encouragement for them. Now let's look at the text this morning. Let's look at Philippians 1 verses 12 through 14 as we look at open doors. Do you examine, do you look for open doors when you're going through adversity? Chances are God has some for you, some open doors that you can witness to and minister to others in times of adversity. Let's look at it. Philippians 1, verses 12 through 14. Verse 12. Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. The opening of this letter is distinct from Paul's other writings through his detailed account of his current circumstances. Usually his personal details came toward the, the bottom or the end of the main body of his letters. This likely points to the mutual affection that had developed between Paul and the church there at Philippi. He quickly then follows these details of his life by assuring his Philippian friends that what was happening to him actually served to advance the gospel. He wanted to point that out to what was happening to me is actually serving to advance the gospel. The importance of what he was about to share was further emphasized by his opening words when he said, Now I want you to know. He started that out. Now I want you to know. He starts that in verse 12 there. What the Philippians were to know was that even though Paul was in chains, God's message was not bound. So even though Paul was bound up physically, God's message was not being bound. He goes on to even assure the Philippians that the gospel had advanced in spite of what had happened to him. His adversity had been a positive factor in the gospel's advance. Concerning the advance of the gospel, Paul first reported about the exposure of the gospel that what was occurring among the whole palace guard, isn't that amazing? The whole palace guard was getting exposed to the gospel. We can only imagine what those who guarded him observed that led to their openness to listen to the gospel. Had they heard Paul singing and praying as he and Silas had done in the Philippian jail 
years before? Or was there something about Paul's demeanor as a prisoner that made them wonder what made him different than the other prisoners that they had guarded? Whatever the case was, Paul assured his Philippian friends and his supporters there at the church that his circumstance had led to evangelizing those soldiers. As to the Imperial Guard, they had come to know that Paul's imprisonment was associated with his devotion to serving the cause of Christ, rather than because of some misdemeanor or crime on his part. So having noted then <coughs> the effect of his imprisonment on the guards, Paul went on to share the second positive result from his imprisonment. His witness while a prisoner had emboldened other believers in Rome to share the gospel. He noted in particular the confidence that came to other Christians to share the gospel of Jesus Christ without fear, ensuring that greater evangelism efforts were taking place because of Paul's adversity. The power of personal example was not missed in Paul's assessment of his circumstances. He did not want the truth to be missed by his readers either. Paul's diversity had served to not only spread the gospel to the imperial guard, but had emboldened other believers in Rome to go out and spread the gospel. Persecution. Persecution for the sake of the gospel can lead to even wider opportunities to share the good news. The key is how believers who are persecuted react to their negative circumstances and how other believers who are observing this persecution react to the circumstances of others. So as you reflect upon the circumstances of other Christians who are being persecuted, even those we mentioned earlier in Afghanistan, does that embolden you to go out and tell others? Or does it discourage you and cause you to shrink away? If we want to have true joy in adversity, we should recognize that the persecution of believers opens doors for the gospel to be proclaimed. Well, now let's look at Philippians 1, verses 15 through 18. This is where we get into mission accomplished. Verse 15, it is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. Paul goes on to continue and describe the advance of the gospel that resulted from his Roman imprisonment. He distinguishes here between impure and pure motives among those who have been emboldened to share the gospel. By introducing his remarks with the words, it is true, Paul made it clear that he was aware of the mixed motives that lay behind the renewed efforts of others to share the good news of Jesus Christ, even in the very heart of the Roman Empire. Possibly news had come to Paul that the Philippians were also aware of those wrong motives on the part of some. So Paul assured them, that he, too, was aware of those impure motives. Those harboring the wrong motives, they bore witness out of envy and rivalry, he mentions there. Their envy of the Apostle Paul stirred them up to attempt to cause division and stirred them up to try to get a greater following than what Paul was amassing. What they failed to count on, though, was that Paul valued the preaching of the right message even if the motivations were wrong. There's an old adage that goes like this. God can hit a straight lick with a crooked stick. You ever heard that before? God can hit a straight lick with a crooked stick. But motives should be in line with the message, even if they aren't. If the gospel message is going forth, the Holy Spirit can still use it to touch the hearts and lives of unbelievers. Paul found pleasure in those who had both the right message and the right motives. The motive of this 
latter group, he says, was love, left without an expressed object. We can know that this group loved both the message they preached and the Christ of that message as well, as well as loving Paul, the message, the messenger there from Christ, who was enduring imprisonment and who was awaiting trial before Caesar. The important point was, and is, that the message be true and accurate, even if the motives are less than commendable. The detractors were not distorting the message, and in recognition of that fact, Paul did not feel the sting of their envy or the sorrow of the strife that could have arisen between him and those who preached from wrong motives. He was more concerned that the gospel go out to a lost and dying world. On the other hand, when people distorted the message, Paul spared no words in pronouncing God's wrath on them. Such was his reaction to those who had distorted the message among the Galatians. We read of this in Galatians 1.8 when Paul wrote, But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. So Paul didn't mind standing up to a false message, and we shouldn't either. No less vehement were his sentiments expressed later in a warning to the Philippians about some who added the gospel of grace to human works of ritual circumcision. When Paul writes in Philippians 3.2, Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. Paul wasn't afraid to call out those who were preaching a false gospel or, or distorting the gospel in some way, or he wasn't afraid to stand up against that. The group that loved Paul recognized that he was put there in chains for the defense of the gospel. Christ had called him to defend the gospel on two continents, as well as in the heart of the Roman Empire before the Emperor Caesar himself. Paul's ministry was a matter of divine appointment and calling. And sometimes you and I may face diverse, ad, adversity in our life. We may face those times of adversity, just like Paul did, as moments of divine appointment and divine calling. Great comfort and confidence can grow when deeply rooted in the conviction that what we are doing is because of God's calling. A firm conviction then about the sovereignty of God gives us a strong foundation upon which we can stand no matter what negative circumstances may develop around us. Out of such conviction, we can ask, what is God up to? rather than whining with the question of, why is this happening to me? So the next time you face adversity, flip the question and don't say, why is this happening to me? But instead ask, what is God up to? And where can I find that open door, that mission that he has prepared for me? Well, having attested the right intentions of those motivated by love, Paul turns then to the intentions of those with wrong motives, who he referred simply to as the former, refraining from any name-calling. He saw that behind their preaching was selfish ambition. They thought they could cause him trouble in his imprisonment. Obviously, they miscalculated the largeness of Paul's heart for the gospel. Listen to verse 18. But what does it matter, he says? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice, yes, and I will continue to rejoice. Since the issue was personal and did not involve a perversion of the gospel, Paul found joy in the fact that the gospel was being spread in Rome. So, in the face of preachers with motives that were not pure, Paul had a simple but a large-hearted response to the former question, what does it matter? 
What matters was not his feelings, but what did matter was Christ is preached. Again, we might note that the issue with Paul was not the message that was put forth by his distractors, but rather their motives. Those who faithfully proclaim the word keep their focus on the advance of the message and not on the advance of personal agendas. That brings us to Philippians 1 verses 19 through 21. We see here God honored. God honored. Let's look at verse 19. For I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Paul not only <coughs> Paul not only rejoiced over the increased spread of the gospel while he was imprisoned, but also over the expectation of his deliverance through the prayers of the Philippians and help from the Spirit of Jesus Christ. His perseverance would not be due simply to his own strong will, but rather due to the prayers of others and the intervention of of the Holy Spirit. From Paul's letters, we know that he placed great stock in the value and effectiveness of prayer. Though separated by distance, the Philippians' prayers for Paul could truly span that distance. There's no such thing as distance when it comes to the power of prayer. Paul also gives a glance into his inmost being with the phrase, I eagerly expect and hope. The joining of these two terms expresses an optimism that he has, an optimistic waiting that's based on a well-founded expectation. I eagerly expect and I hope, he says. In no circumstance that was surrounding Paul or no outcome that was awaiting him, would in any way make Paul ashamed. Just as he had lived and ministered with sufficient courage, he faced his future with that same boldness, whether that future was to be defined by life or by death. At this point in his life, Paul was living with a mixture of certainty and uncertainty. He was certain about his intention that Christ was to be honored while remaining uncertain about how this intention would unfold in his circumstances. He boldly faced his future with a firm expectation and with the full intent that Christ would be exalted whether by his continuing to live on this earth or by his serving to face a martyr's death. Like Paul, all believers honor God by being faithful to him in life and in death. Paul was a master here in putting together the shorthand of, of how all this could be encapsulated. He captures the entire matter of Christian living in one word that he chose to use, and that word was this, the word Christ. He has a, a very profound but simple statement that he makes here. For to me to live is Christ. Paul uses this simple preposition to explain that Christian life is a gift that is in Christ, that it is Christ. He even refers to this in Romans 8.1. Another example of this can also be found in Galatians 2.20 where he says, Christ in me. This expression has a double spiritual union here that gives us a great summary of Christian living. There's security that comes with this summary of Christian living that's bound up in this spiritual union that Paul refers to when he says to live is Christ. He could also could, aff could affirm because of that that to die is gain. For Christians, living indeed is Christ during one's lifetime, and it should be all about Christ during our lifetime. And dying will mean even more of Christ 
for all eternity. Now as we wrap up this morning, let's look at our last piece, Philippians 1, verses 22 through 26. We see here the adage, Christ alone, Christ alone. Verse 22, if I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far, but it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Having given thought to the fact that living is Christ and dying is gain, Paul confesses then to a dilemma. Which would be better, to continue living or to pass through death into Christ's eternal presence? On the one hand, he understood that to continue living would mean fruitful work. Given the options of more fruitful ministry or even transitioning into heaven left Paul with a win-win situation, even though he felt the pull in both directions, because he was torn by his desire to depart and be with Christ, while at the same time he felt this need to remain in the flesh for the benefit of his Philippian friends. The first of these alternatives he recognized to be better by far for him, but he also lived with the other alternative, which was more necessary for the Philippians. What do we choose when faced with an option that is more desirable for us versus one that is more needful for ministering to others? To what extent would our own love mitigate our inconvenience. Listen to verses 25 through 26 as we wrap up today. Verse 25, convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. The needs of others rose up in Paul's thinking to create the impression that he would not die at that time, but would remain and continue with the Philippians in order to assist their progress and joy in the faith. The needs of others outweighed Paul's desire to be with Christ immediately. To be sure, such a preference was not fueled by a fear of physical death, but rather by his love and concern for the needs of others. Paul speaks about the ramifications of living or dying. As he weighed the benefits of each option, Paul's explicit concern for the Philippians, that was what was foremost on his heart. He expressed his concern, being that their boasting in Christ Jesus will abound. His release and return to Philippi would have this purpose when he came to them again, and hopefully would produce both joy and and encouragement for them. This same underlying purpose holds true for all of us, namely that the encouragement of other believers produces joy and purpose in the ones who do the encouraging. The two letters to Timothy and the one to Titus offer evidence that Paul was indeed released from this Roman imprisonment and that he had the opportunity for further ministry that did include a trip through Macedonia that we can presume would have also included some ministry in Philippi. 1 Timothy 1.3 alludes to this. So the key doctrine that we're going to focus on today throughout this whole study <coughs> focuses around evangelism and missions. And we can sum it up like this. It is the duty of every child of God to constantly seek to win the loss to Christ by verbal witness, strengthened by a Christian lifestyle, and by other means in harmony with the gospel of Christ. Listen to 2 Timothy 4, 5. But you keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry, have joy in adversity, look for the open doors, be, be committed to seeing the gospel go forth when you face adversity for the cause of Christ. Then your joy will abound 
even in tough times. Thanks again for joining. I look forward to your comments there in the chat. And I look forward to our next time that we can study the Bible together. Don't forget to turn, tune in to our live stream. Starts at 11. And also be in prayer for all those who are taking part in the service. God bless you. Have a great rest of your day and a great rest of your week. I pray that God will bless this study to your heart as he has to mine. Until next time.